Welcome everyone to today's um, HDR seminar. Uh, we have Mike Tony with us. Um, he is going to talk about data challenges in synchrotron X-ray scattering. And he's a professor at the University of Colorado, so the same institution um, where I am at. Um, and uh, he's a professor in the chemical and biological engineering department. And he pioneered the use of X-ray scattering and spectroscopy to determine the atomic structure in materials for energy applications, and especially with a focus on solar energy and energy storage. Um, he, he's also very interested in hybrid metal halide perovskite, solar absorbers, uh, lithium rich cathodes, and electrode electrolyte interfaces in, in various energy storage systems. So, so thank you very much, uh, Mike, and uh, yeah, we look forward to your talk. Uh, okay, great. Uh, hold on. So let me go ahead and get this started. Uh, okay, great. There we go. Um, so, you know, the title, as Henrik gave, is pretty general. I'm going to focus in on this talk on one specific application um, for a number of reasons that will be kind of apparent as I kind of, as I go, as I go through the talk. Um, excuse me. Uh, so this is kind of a short outline. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention the method I'm going to talk about. So I'll be talking about what's basically called 3D diffuse scattering. Um, this has been a method that's been around for a long time, many, many decades. Um, and for reasons that I'll talk about, I, I think that this is poised to kind of make some significant inroads in, in terms of material science. Um, so in any case, here's an outline. I'll talk, I'll explain to you what the few scattering is since I expect that not that many people who are on the talk know. And then I'll relate this to what I think is kind of an, uh, it, it, there's increased understanding in the fact that local order, which is not something that's measured easily by uh, X-ray diffraction, uh, is is in, is increasingly recognized being a strong impact uh, or strong determinant in terms of materials functionality. And since this is kind of a data uh, seminar, I'll talk about the challenges that are associated with this. I'll focus on diffuse scattering, but this is actually more general. And then I'll give a short example in terms of the metal halide perovskite uh, work that that we've recently been doing. Um, so first of all, what is diffuse scattering? So this is kind of what I show in my class as a conventional x-ray experiment. X-rays come in, you have in this case some sample and labeled as a single crystal. And then we detect the x-rays in nowadays pretty much uh, ubiquitously with a large area detector. So this down here is an example of a diffraction pattern that we've all seen kind of, or some version of this published in the literature. And then I've labeled this with the Bragg peaks that come from diffraction. The diffuse scattering then is the one, the scatter, the X-ray scattering and neutron scattering and actually electron scattering that doesn't appear in the Bragg peaks. So it's a broad background under, under here and I'll show exactly what that looks like in a little more detail in the next slide, but it's kind of a broad background in here. And when people do diffraction, they completely ignore this. And when people do crystallography, they pretty much completely ignore this. Um, and, and so the, the, I'll explain what the manifestations of that uh, kind of are a little bit um, in, over the next few slides. So let, I'll, I'll give another example of what diffuse scattering looks like. This is now for what you would call a powdered fraction pattern. So it's, it's a, a, you know, a bunch of different single crystals. And at some point, uh, all of them, one of them diffracts. And so you see these kind of strong peaks that emerge. In the single crystal, you don't really get that case, um, but you do get the Bragg peaks. Um, so now let me explain to you what diffuse, what diffuse scattering is. This is now a map of basically the diffraction pattern where I've labeled the Bragg peaks. It looks different than the powder pattern I showed you before because this is a single, basically a single crystal. So one way to think about that, if you remember from the previous slide, I had this big area detector little bit loose here, but you know, if you have a single crystal, basically that's the pattern that you will see that emerges um, on that area, on that large area detector. 
Um, if we now actually look at this more carefully and we actually start to blow up kind of the intensity scale, um, what we see is now all this kind of structure that, that appears underneath or between the Bragg peaks. And in this case, this is highly structured. You know, we kind of see this uh, kind of cross uh, type pattern. We see these kind of bands or streaks that uh, connect Bragg peaks. Um, and, and then, you know, then their regions that basically don't really have much intensity. So that's basically what diffuse, what diffuse scattering is and will pretty much be the focus of, of the next, uh, um, well, not quite an hour discussion. Um, so just going back here, crystallography, which has been around for almost a hundred years now, has been highly successful then in basically looking at these Bragg peaks and then interpreting a material structure from that. Basically, um, if you think about organics, what the packing, molecular packing is, if you think about proteins, what the arrangement of the atoms and what the arrangement of the proteins are, or for inorganic materials, basically where the atoms are within the crystal structure. And this has been enormously successful. Um, and as I said, we're in that case ignoring um, this, but there are some limitations to what you get from, from basically crystallography or diffraction. And that I think is best illustrated here. So now this is a uh, uh, kind of a thought experiment or a uh, physicist would call this toy model. Um, so down here I'm in the dark, I'm basically representing some atom, we'll call it a blue atom. Um, and then I'm throwing in on the order of 20% of um, these green or actually yellow to me, uh, vacancies or substituting atom um, or some other kind of basically a defect. And on the left side over here, or my left side, um, this is the, a kind of a random uh, situation where there's a kind of uh, each, each atom is represented randomly um, giving the 20% of, of green, um, whether, be, whether it's blue or green. And then on the right side is a very different situation where now we're allowing some probability that if there's a green atom or a green vacancy, there's gonna be clustering. Um, and so if we look at these, these are obviously wildly different. You know, if you just look, you, you say these are very, very different patterns that kind of emerge from this. And it's not a wild extrapolation to expect that if this was a real material, these would have very different properties. Um, but as I'll show you in the next slide, the average structure of these, um, as seen by diffraction, basically is exact, exactly the same. So in a conventional diffraction experiment, you can't distinguish these. So this is a kind of diffraction pattern that you can actually easily calculate in that example. Um, so the left side in red, is the random situation shown here. And then the blue um, is basically the clusters of vacancies. And basically this, uh, this is uh, basically the Miller index. So if you wanna call it H that labels each of the diffraction peaks um, and you know, basically looking at the intensities as we move along a line say here. Um, and so the important thing that comes out of this is basically these look the same Actually, you can show analytically that they are, they are basically exactly the same. Um, and so it's impossible then with diffraction to be able to distinguish these. Um, but now if we do what we just did in a couple of slides ago and look in more detail, look at the diffuse scattering uh, for the random case it's shown over here and the vacancies shown over here. This is now basically Miller indices. So integers labeled diffraction peaks um, and this is a two dimensions. So this is one direction and this is the other direction. Um, and all of the kind of, uh, uh, kind of smeary intensity down here, and this is a log scale. Um, and in here um, are due to basically the defects that, that are present in this kind of, uh, kind of thought experiment. And now if you look at the debut scattering, these are obviously different to kind of anyone. In the case of the clusters, you have um, a lot of intensity kind of near the peaks and then these very distinct lines of intensities that, that uh, basically connect the peaks. Whereas in the random case, actually by eye for most people, it doesn't seem like there is any kind of diffuse scattering or diffuse intensity here. 
but if you you look carefully kind of in this region, you see there's there's kind of a very broad um, kind of distribution with a little bit of intensity here. That's basically due to the fact that on average, you kind of only have one or two of, of the vacancies and that gives rise to kind of this broad diffraction. Whereas here, um, you have the more clusters that have lines um, or kind of planes and that gives rise to the kind of uh, the, the uh, streaks that you, that you see here. So at least in principle, you know, this would allow us to, do, or will allow us to distinguish these two different structures now. Um, and so that's basically the essence of the of kind of the method. Um, and as I'll go through the talk, what I will basically show you is nowadays it is actually very easy to collect real data that look like this. And then the challenges, challenges are associated largely with the data interpretation. I'm hoping that this community can help, uh, can help us kind of drive that along. Um, <clears throat> so that's great, but who cares? Why does it, why does it um, necessarily matter? Um, and so the short range structure or the local order, or you think about it, the local disorder actually has an enormous impact on many kinds of uh, materials function or functionality. And I've listed just a couple in here. Some of these are largely condensed matter physics, but at least something that I'm really interested in is in terms of line conduction. Um, you could think of this actually equally well in terms of um, kind of electronic conductivity. Um, but I'm particularly interested in ion conductivity, and I'll give you an example of why the local order matters there. Um, here's an example with a couple of, uh, in some cases, recently recent references. Um, the bottom paper, I think, is this particular um, kind of compound, which is a Prussian, Prussian blue compound. Um, and the, you have vacancies that can form in these compounds and the local arrangement of the vacancies, which are shown by these giant green spheres, basically uh, a vacancy is basically the pore. Um, so the arrangement of basically the vacancies gives rise to some kind of connected pore structure, which has a very strong impact on things like transport through the, the pressure blue compound. So that's one example. Um, I'll give you a couple more of these two. Um, um, and here's uh, kind of one from nearly 40 years ago. Um, and this is actually calcium uh, fluoride. Uh, here, this is the diffuse scattering pattern that was collected again 40 years ago. Um, what was found was that the calcium ions, which are shown kind of uh, here, uh, are basically melted. Um, so the calcium ions are mobile. They actually can move very facilely through their sublattice. So you can easily get motion from say here to there. Um, and as a consequence, you can get very high calcium, uh, calcium ion conductivity um, in, um, uh, in, in this particular compound above some certain transition temperature. And so one of the reasons I'm using this example is just to point out that this method has been around for a long time. Uh, but as I'll show you in a few slides, there actually have been advances that will allow us now to basically collect what probably took someone two or three weeks worth of data collection at that time. Now we can do that in a matter of minutes. Um, so that's one example, um, you know, if you care about organics, uh, here's one particular uh, kind of other uh, molecule where, where where you see kind of this very distinct uh, diffuse scattering pattern, uh, and I'm just showing you this to because this data set, uh, which actually almost certainly came from film, now is uh, 80 years old. Um, so this just makes the point that in organics you can have very similar kinds of um, kinds of uh, behavior just due to the local arrangement uh, of the molecules. Um, so the thing that I'm, one of the things that I'm most interested in um, is for battery space is uh, cathodes. So um, this shows you uh, basically on the right side over here, uh, the crystal structure of the, um, of the cathodes that all of us have in our phones. Um, so in this case, uh, we have a layer shown in black of transition metals, the layer of oxygen between this, uh, and then there's another layer of lithium. 
Uh, and so when you charge uh, your cell phone, you basically have the lithium ions that transport very well through these kind of planes. Basically, uh, you delithiate the cathode. So the lithium ions move into the electrolyte and then eventually into the anode. Uh, and that's the charging process. So not surprisingly, you kind of have this plane that the lithium ions can move through. Um, and so that gives pretty good connectivity. Um, one of the challenges here is though that the lithium ions will eventually uh, leave here. And so now you have these two negatively charged oxygens, which are uh, kind of facing each other. That's not an energetically stable state. So some of the transition um, metals can kind of what's known as migration. Basically, they jump into the lithium ion sites. And that's one of the mechanisms for instability um, and then eventually degradation in, bat in, in kind of battery materials. That's particularly true for a number of classes of, of kind of um, uh, 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 cathodes, particularly very high capacity cathodes. Um, so the thought was, okay, we know we have this mode of instability. Why don't we just kind of take that to the extreme and now completely disorder the lithium ions in the transition metals um, so for each uh, lithium ion, uh, you know, each position here uh, will have an equal probability of having a lithium ion or a transition metal. And so that gives rise to basically what is a rock salt like structure, where now the cations are disordered. So you can equally well have a lithium ion or a transition metal here shown as iron. Um, uh, in reality, for real materials, you will use a variety of different kinds of transition metals. Um, and so, you know, these disordered rock salt materials have been the subject of some recently uh, recent um, kind of intensity, much, much of this kind of pushed by Gerd Cedar and his, his kind of co-workers. And so it turns out, uh, according to the modeling that's been done, that kind of the precise local order, so if this is a transition metal um, or a lithium ion, you know, what's the probability of having another lithium ion around it? That actually has an enormous impact on the connectivity, uh, ion connectivity, which of course really matters for uh, a cathode. And so in particular, the tendency to have the, some, some measure of local order will have a big impact um, on the lithium diffusion. Um, and basically that is the, uh, kind of this local order or local disorder that I've, that I've kind of been talking about for the last 10, 15 minutes or so. Um, so what does the scattering from that looks like? Turns out it's right now challenging to do, do x-rays, but you can do electrons. So this shows you now a pristine cathode. And if you look carefully, sorry, that's not the best image. You see this kind of ring-like structure that looks like this. So this is kind of the uh, um, discharged uh, kind of cathode. If you cycle it, you see that there's kind of a pronounced change. You now see something that's around here and these kind of ring-like structures are, are kind of lost. Um, so this is an example of a, a diffuse scattering pattern that you can get out of this. Turns out that it's really hard to do in a kind of an analysis of electrons in, in this kind of a space, just due to the fact that you have very strong um, interaction of the electrons with the material. Um, and so this actually comes from William Chen. Um, um, basically, this data can't really be analyzed. And so it's difficult to necessarily connect to this directly to, to this and then to, the, to get a better understanding of how the local structure um, impacts the, the, the basically the ion connectivity. Um, and so that's why as a material scientist um, or someone who makes materials, uh, local order actually matters and it's something that we need to be paying attention to. And it's particularly, it's, this is a ubiquitous or large, almost ubiquitous um, kind of idea. Um, and it's really important now as we start to deal with multi-component kinds of systems uh, where we start to alloy in um, kind of additional elements through in battery spaces in, as well as kind of uh, a number of other kinds of physics and chemistry um, areas. Um, okay, so, you know, I talked uh, about diffuse scattering. I talked about it mostly from the x-ray side. Uh, as, I, as I'll show you in a few minutes, the neutron side is pretty much the same. 
Uh, I talk about local order, try to give you a sense of what that is, and, and tell you that that has an impact on diffuse scattering. I'll go into that in a little more detail a little bit later. Uh, so what I do now um, over the next maybe 20 minutes or so is tell you about the data challenges that we have um, in kind of understanding this, and then give you one kind of partial example that, that my group has kind of been involved in looking at the metal halide perovskites. Um, so maybe uh, it's a good time to stop and ask and see if there are any questions. Okay, so I will just go ahead and go on. Um, so I showed you this slide uh, before. Um, this, as I said, is a slide of basically taken from my um, kind of characterization class. Uh, so from the X-ray side of this, they're kind of so this is a typical X-ray experiment. We have a source, we have a single crystal, and then we have a, an area detector that that kind of sits out here. Um, from the X-ray experiment side, there are kind of three important parts of this. One is the source. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the other one is the detector. I'll talk about that in two minutes. Um, and then at least for this class of diffuse scattering experiments, you have to have a single crystal. And so the single crystal part is actually really important here as well. Um, so this getting a good single crystal is really crucial to these kinds of experiments. Here's a nice example. This was actually for a neutron experiment that my student Jillian grew. Um, and I'm showing you this because it actually I think it's very beautiful. Um, and you can see it's a half, this, sorry, this is a centimeter. So it's uh, almost five millimeters on a side. Um, and that's kind of what's required for a neutron experiment. For the X-ray experiments, you can get down to single crystals of about a hundred microns or so. And I think there's, uh, well, I'm certainly in, interested in trying to push that down to to kind of 50 microns and possibly lower because in many classes of materials, those, those now become kind of an interesting size regime. Um, so that's, you know, the important part from the sample side. Um, you know, one of the things that has happened in the X-ray community over the last uh, 50 plus years has been an enormous growth in the capabilities of the X-ray source. And so as I show here, the source is actually one of the important parts here. And so the X-ray community likes to kind of make this plot. So in the red, uh, basically there's a plot of what's called the X-ray source brilliance. So you can think about this as kind of the laser-like quality of the X-ray beam that you're using for the experiment. So down here, a lantern is not particularly bright, uh, but a laser is. So even though the number of photons per second that come out of your lamp uh, integrated over the whole area and the number of the laser may be the same, all of the ones from the laser are pointed in the same direction and they come out of a very small um, kind of uh, space, space. So this uh, kind of a source is much, much brilliant, more brilliant than this. And so that's what I mean here by brilliance. And so the red is basically a plot. Uh, this actually ends about 10, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, the X-ray sources, and you know, they have this is a log scale, log linear scale. So this is some exponential curve. And the X-ray community likes to, the synchrodoc community likes to compare that to computing power. And clearly, the slope for the X-rays is more about a factor of two more than for the for kind of the computational power. Um, so there's a basically a, a factor of uh, so the doubling time from the x-ray side is about half. You know, from a personal side, you know, I started to do experiments in kind of the late, mid to late 80s. Um, and so if we now go up to something like 2010, so almost 10 years ago, there's been a factor of 10 to the 10 growth in kind of the source intensity. So that is a significant value. Now, I'm not going to say that experiments are 10 to 10 times easier, faster than they were when I started, um, but they certainly are qualitatively easier to do now um, than they were 10 years ago or even, 40, or even 30 or 40 years ago. Um, and so one of the implications of this is that the data stream that can come out of any, any synchrotrons 
has gone up enormously compared to to uh, you know what it was even five or ten years ago. Certainly, much more than it was say forty years ago. Not ten to ten, uh, but certainly sig significantly. And that is creating or will create kind of uh, challenges within the data community. This is kind of recognized, although the solutions aren't necessarily recognized. And so I will be using that or the 3D diffuse scattering as an example of kind of the challenges that are associated with that. And that is, is partly due to, to this kind of exponential growth. The other thing which um, is a little bit less appreciated is that detector technology has also improved enormously, maybe not 10 to the 10, uh, but certainly qualitatively over the last, probably more like 10 to 15 years. And so these very large area detectors, um, it, which this, this is not, this is several tens of centimeters across. Um, um, so the X-ray beam comes in here, sample sits here, and then this large area detector um, will collect the data set. Uh, now in a highly parallel fashion, whereas when I started, we never did anything in a parallel way. It was all done sequentially. So this is kind of a two-dimensional regime of collecting data. When I started, it was basically zero uh, dimension. So there's a little point detector that you'd have to scan through this large area. Um, and as a consequence of this, coupled with the developments in, in, in the source, we now can collect data sets um, that are much larger, much faster. Um, and that's perhaps most apparent in this diffuse scattering that I was discussing. Um, so this, this is basically another way of showing basically the same experiment. The important part is down here. Basically the way you do this is you basically continuously uh, or you spin the sample at about a degree a second over somewhere in the order of 180 to 360 degrees. And then you collect data at 10 Hertz. So every 10th of a second readout time is basically small compared to that 10th of a second. Uh, I haven't gone through the math. I got this from actually from Matt, um, but this basically corresponds to something like three terabytes per day. Um, and so for one sample, you can basically collect a complete data set in 30 minutes. So the data sets that some of the data sets I was showing you a little bit earlier basically would be collected in 30 minutes. So now, you know, we can collect in a day somewhere in the order of uh, approaching kind of 50 data sets. Um, and so this is lots of data that we have to process. Um, the processing is reasonably straightforward to try to do, at least in principle, and I'm not really going to talk about that much. Um, the analysis is really what I want to try to focus on, and I'm hoping that those of you on the call can kind of have some ideas on how we can start to try to advance that. Um, if we just looked at diffraction space, this would be like 60,000 60, um, kind of Bragg peaks for some kind of uh, reasonable unit cell. Um, so the point is, from the X-ray side, we are generating lots and lots of data uh, that need to be processed and, more importantly, need to be analyzed and eventually interpret, interpreted. And that, I think, is a challenge. Um, so that's the X-ray side. Is similar things have happened in the neutron community. Um, and so I'm just showing you the instrument um, at Oak Ridge that has developed over the last few years. Uh, neutron sources haven't developed at the rate of X-ray sources. The detector technology probably has. Um, but you now can collect neutron data sets, not in 30 minutes, but certainly at a time frame that was not possible even five or 10 years ago. Um, and I'm showing you the neutron case, even though the, I think the title had x-rays in it, basically because the data I'll show you is, is neutron data. So I wanted to, to kind of equally acknowledge that the neutron community is having a similar, will have a similar challenge. Um, okay, so um, I've been, in everything I've talked about so far, you know, I've kind of thought about atoms as being static entities and not moving. So if you go back to one of the first slides that I showed you where we had this kind of toy model with the blue, um, with the blue circles and uh, the uh, yellow or green circles, basically they weren't allowed to vibrate. The reality is in any, uh, in any kind of real material, atoms are moving. Um, and in some cases they're moving a lot. 
And so that's a manifestation of disorder. So when I talk about disorder um, or local order, you have to realize that that includes the static component as well as the dynamic component. Um, and both of these are actually quite important. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because in the examples that I'll show you, example that I will show you, uh, that dynamics is actually quite important. And most of what we see in the diffuse scattering is associated with the dynamics. Um, and so we can kind of, so again, a little bit of a, a simplification, but we can kind of think of these in, in kind of equivalent terms. Um, okay, great. So now um, in maybe the next 10 or 15 minutes, I'll tell you about some of the work that we're, we, we're doing um, in terms of the metal halide perovskites. Um, so for those of you who don't, are not familiar with these compounds, the perovskite structure, which is basically ABX3, um, has been known for more than a century, I think. Um, and certainly in the oxide version where X is an oxygen um, ion, there's been many, many papers and much work that's been done in this. Uh, if we uh, not don't have X and oxygen, but have a, um, a single valent or a single um, uh, um, anion, a single charged anion, um, you can equally we all get perovskite structures in the halide versions of these. Uh, so if we have X iodide chloride, uh, chloride or bromide, um, that those compounds have been known for a while. Um, probably over the last 10 to 12 years, the big versions where B is lead and then A is some large, in this case, maybe organic uh, or um, large ion. The, these are the metal halide perovskites have taken the PV community by storm. Um, and it's largely because you can get very high uh, power conversion efficiencies that come out of come out of these. So there's been an enormous amount of interest in in this. I think at one point we estimated there were like ten papers a day that were kind of coming out on this. I don't know if that's true anymore, but it was certainly a few years ago. So anyway, there's a lot of interest in this, and this shows you again that particular structure. So the lead uh, is sitting in the center here. The purple are the, the halides. They form this octahedra. The octahedra then are corner shared. So you have this kind of three, um, uh, three dimensional structure that forms. And then basically for space filling, you have some large um, single charged cation that sits in the center of these. Typically that cesium or the, the ammonium um, ion um, that's kind of shown here. Um, you know, this is a static picture and the static picture here is not particularly good. So if we look at an MD simulation, in this case done by Jarvis Frost, Jonathan Skelton and Aaron Walsh um, uh, while they were at Imperial, um, here's the lead, uh, here's the halide um, and here's the ions. Um, this is just one unit cell, so sometimes atoms pop in and out. Um, but you can see that the, basically the structures here are highly dynamic. The, cation, the organic cations are moving all over the place. Uh, you can't really see this, but they are, that motion is coupled through to the, basically the distortions um, and the rotations that are associated with the, the octahedra as well. So the point of this is, this is something that's uh, unique perhaps compared to classic inorganic uh, semiconductors like silicon or gallium arsenide in that they're highly dynamic and uh, that those dynamics is a manifestation basically of dynamic, what we call dynamical disorder. Um, and that is expected to have a strong impact on kind of the functional on the functionality, uh, particularly through things like coupling of the electron transport and basically the phonons or the motions that are involved here. Um, and so we have been interested probably over the last five plus years of trying to understand the lattice dynamics or basically understand these motions, basically understand what the disorder is um, in this case. And when I say disorder here, I'm referring to the dynamic aspect of this. Um, so here's an example of uh, the few scattering data that were taken by um, my postdoc Nick, um, uh, graduate student Julian. 
uh, the fantastic beamline scientists at Oak Ridge um, uh, and then Hamaker and Nadasa. Uh, and so this is an example now of the diffuse scattering data that we have for um, a conventional metal halide perovskite. Uh, so this is now in two different regions. So this is a 3D map of kind of uh, reciprocal space or Q space or diffraction space. Um, and so uh, Miller indices H run this way, K run this way, and L run out of the board. Uh, so L equal to one, two, et cetera, would be Bragg peaks. So here we are L a half, so we're halfway between two Bragg peaks. And here is L equal to one and a half. Um, and then you know we would see a Bragg peak. One is here, so like like somewhere about in here. Um, and I think another one somewhere about in there. Um, but what you clearly see is kind of these distinct, um, basically streaks of diffraction, a little bit of uh, intensity at these specific points. Um, and so you see this uh, an actual kind of a, uh, almost a checkerboard-like pattern that you kind of see at L equal to half. And now if we move to L equal to one and a half, the nature of that pattern kind of changes distinctly. Um, <clears throat> So as I said, this is a manifestation of the disorder. Um, the challenge that we really have is that it's very hard to interpret that. And then that's part of the reason that I'm trying to give, that I am giving this talk is to try to hopefully get some of the, uh, the data science community interested in helping us uh, to kind of understand these data sets, which you know, as I talked about earlier, can be taken now in a matter of hours, or in some cases in a matter of 30 minutes or so. Um, and so it's actually very easy to write down an exact expression for what the diffuse scattering will look like. So what we expect to see in this, if we know where the atoms are, and so that's the expression is given here. Um, so in this case, Q is basically the vector moving from the origin to wherever the point is here. Um, R is basically the, the spacing between two atoms. So if this is where we're starting, you know, you, some, you have some other uh, atom sitting out here. So that's the vector difference between these. Um, the Bs here are basically labeled the atom type. So it's the scattering strength of the atoms. You can basically calculate that really quite uh, straightforwardly, at least if you know where the atoms are. Uh, do this kind of double sum um, and calculate what the intensity is. That's like actually exactly what was done in kind of the, the diffraction patterns that I showed you in diffuse scattering patterns that I showed you at the beginning of the talk. Um, but the inverse problem, so going from here to, to here is actually much more challenging. And there's not really a good way to do this. And so, uh, as I said, this is a decades old method. And, and you know, there are a number of a kind of approximations that I'm kind of listing here where you can, and I don't want to go into these in detail, but you can basically extract fitting parameters. Some of those are shown in here. Um, and then try to fit the data that I've shown you before. This you know, kind of worked, say, 20 and 30 years ago when the data sets were reasonably limited. But because we now have this kind of data, and this is actually only a portion of what we have, we have this is three-dimensional, so it comes out of the plane as well. Um, trying to do that actually turns out not to work particularly well. Um, and so we have to kind of adopt other ways to, to try to, to do this. Um, and so let me skip that. So one of the other ways is basically a so-called pair distribution function. So let me introduce that now. And I'll introduce that by, by noting that the 1D version of everything that I've talked about so far has been well established over the past 20 plus years by Simon Billings, Tagashi Gami, and Pete Chupas, uh, um, initiated by them. And basically, now if we replace our single crystal by a bunch of uh, randomly oriented single crystals, uh, we can basically count, uh, measure the diffraction pattern. So that's shown here. Um, it's now something that's one dimensional as opposed to three dimensional. Um, so we can take this diffraction pattern, we can basically for a transform it, kind of shown in here, and create the so-called G of R function, which uh, basically is the probability if I'm an atom at some point, what is the probability that there's another atom you know, some distance away? 
And so here's this G of R function. So if there's an atom at zero, you know, this tells you there are probably a, a strong probability of another atom somewhat less than three angstroms away. And, you know, the peaks then label kind of atomic distances. Uh, distances now, not vectors. Um, so this method has been used for a while. Um, this is just one other example. Uh, in this case, it's a graphite or graphene of uh, the kind of uh, pattern one, this actually measurement, you would expect to see where again, these are labeling carbon carbon bond distances. So that, that's 1.42 angstrom, sorry, the scales cut off, but that's what this distance is. And then you have additional um, kind of neighbors that come up. So this works real well in, in one dimensions. Uh, you're, because you're going from three dimensions to one dimensions, you're kind of throwing away a bunch of information, which is why I think that when it, it, this is kind of a little bit limited in terms of interpreting local order, uh, but it works very real well. And so now we can adopt this uh, in three dimensional space. Um, and so that's kind of illustrated here. So the idea is we have our diffuse scattering pattern. We actually now subtract out the Bragg peaks um, so it's actually pretty easy to do that because they're very intense, very highly localized uh, spots. Um, and then basically do a three-dimensional Fourier transform of the now diffuse scattering um, into, into basically real space and end up with what's been labeled the 3D delta PDF measurement. So this uh, kind of a method works, uh, I would say sometimes. Um, and so this is an example, actually this is for one of the pressure blue compounds. Um, and so if you see a positive peak, which is now here shown in red, that means there's a higher probability than average for there to be um, an atom at that particular uh, position. And then if you see a blue peak, then there's a lower probability than average. So this kind of encodes the local structure. Um, and it kind of works, but I think it's fair to say that it's been less useful than I think we, as a community, expected initially, um, because again, you really need a model to try to get this, get this to, to kind of work in with the data. At least we struggled with, although we can make these very easily, we struggled with the interpretation. Um, <clears throat> I think a better way, and I'll show you an example of that, is to go to the MD community where they can basically calculate uh, the atomic trajectories or the atomic positions and then for transform that. And I'll show you an example of how we've been successful there. Um, so this is the same data set I showed you before for the metal halide perovskites um, that we ob obtained uh, actually probably about a year ago. Um, we tried to do the 3D Delta PDF. And so here this is, uh, and we've struggled with more or less six months of trying to interpret that and not been successful. Um, but what has been done more recently, and this is very much thanks to Ty Sterling, who's a, a grad student in physics here at uh, CU with uh, Dmitry Resnick, was to take existing um, MD simulations from Zhu and Erdogan at uh, University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana uh, and basically Fourier transform this. And I say that like it's easy. In principle, it is, it's not as easy. I'm sure it's not as easy as I, I, I can, I can uh, as, I, as I necessarily say. Um, the other thing that's really nice about the MD is you can basically turn on and off atoms. So you can calculate the scattering pattern in this metal halide perovskite only due to the octahedra or only due to the ions, basically by turning off the scattering kind of fictitiously for these different regimes. Um, and so that's kind of what's shown here. So here now is kind of the cage mode. So that's the octahedra. So that's only now uh, looking at what the contribution to this few scattering of the octahedra is. And you see, we see these pretty much distinct points with very weak uh, kind of intensity between these. Um, now, if we only look at the, um, basically in this case, the methylammonia modes, uh, the contribution of the methylammonia, we now start to see this kind of and very distinct pattern that we see in, in the data. If we kind of add these together, we see something like th that, that looks like this. Um, and I'm sorry, the scales are not quite right, but if you look carefully at this and compare it to that. You can see, for example, here, we see this kind of uh, 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 um, broken square, which agrees very well with this kind of broken square in here, intensity here, which agrees in here. 
Um, so this, uh, you know, is really great because now we can start to understand. In this case, the dynamical disorder that's associated with these particular um, these particular ions, and it gives us some insight if we now look to the MD um, in terms of in terms of kind of understanding the the, the disorder that's present. Um, but you know, this has been at least a six month project or a year's project. And if we can collect a data set in 30 minutes, um, you don't want to spend six months analyzing it. And so I think the data and interpretation challenge that comes out of this is basically how do we take these kinds of data sets and now analyze these in a much faster and potentially more accurate um, kind of a way. Um, and that I think is a challenge, well, for the community and hopefully I'm hoping that people in data science community where we can make these kinds of plots very easily can, can, help, can help us in terms of understanding this. Um, so where do I think this is gonna try to go? And this is in some ways kind of a summary. Uh, I, I think that the impact of local order on properties is uh, uh, rather underappreciated in the community. And I, you know, I think this has been changing over the last at least five years. Um, and and you know, things like the disordered rock salt are part are one example of where it is recognized. What well, that statement that I make there is basically false, uh, but it is appreciated that the local order has a big impact on things like ion conductivity. Um, certainly in the ion conductivity regime for electrolytes and batteries, I think that this statement is starting to not be true anymore. And certainly within, uh, for example, the energy storage hub, it is very much appreciated now that local order really matters in terms of ion transport. Um, so maybe has been underappreciated and is starting to become more appreciated a better way to try to phrase this. And so this, of course, as I said, is really hard, if not impossible to kind of assess with x ray diffraction. I think part of the reason that this is true is because diffraction has been so successful um, in getting average crystal structure. Um, so, you know, the, the impact of this is we want to be able to measure local structure better. Um, as I showed you, the advances that have made in, in instrumentation uh, over the past five to 10 years. Uh, or beyond that even, have really transformed our ability to do these kinds of measurements. Um, so it's very easy to create this kind of a diffraction pattern, as I said, now in some very large space, um, basically in half an hour. Um, what we really need is kind of, there have been advances in kind of new ways of analyzing data. I talked a little bit about this. We've not been successful in getting this work, other people have. But I think in terms of, hopefully machine learning kind of approaches and perhaps coupled with computational modeling, we can start to make some advances in trying to be able to more quickly uh, analyze these kinds of data sets. And I guess this is a manifestation of fact we are very data rich and understanding poor, uh, understanding, poor, understanding poor. But if as a community we're successful in this, I think that this can give start to give unique insight into how local order or disorder, um, really the same thing, uh, has a manifestation in things like structure function relationships in, in a variety of kinds of materials that come out of this. Um, so anyway, that's that was the reason I gave this talk was basically able to make this pitch and try to get some, you know, for those of you in the data science community, try to get some interest in this. Um, so last I should really thank the people who, who did all the work here. So um, you know, in terms of male highlight proskite work, uh, Nick uh, and Julian were, so Nick's there, and there's Julian, uh, were responsible for that work. That was all funded by the Choice EFRC. Uh, Emma um, has been really helpful, and she's shown here, uh, in terms of helping me think about the this in battery space. Um, Ty and Dimitri were very helpful in terms of doing the analysis that we've gotten. Um, you know, I'd want to thank Matt Ray for actually providing a lot of slides and context. And then within the neutron measurements, Fengi, uh, the beamline scientist at Oak Ridge, really phenomenal in terms of helping us basically do a mail-in experiment, um, which 
really was uh, one of the few kinds of data sets we could, we could have gotten over the last year due to COVID-19. Um, and last, I wanna thank, thank you for your attention and I'll happily take any questions. Thank you so much for this <clears throat> beautiful talk. Yeah, I, I, if I can ask a question, I, I have a question. Uh, Mike, really very interesting and motivating talk. I was wondering if the molecular dynamic simulations that are done are with the perfect crystals or are there vacancies or other defects that are introduced in, in the simulation? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I would have to go back and look. My guess is the ones I showed you were not done intentionally with vacancies put in. Um, I, I could be wrong on that though. And that may just be a manifestation of, you know, if you think about normal vacancy levels, they're pretty low, so you need a gigantic unit cell to be able to simulate right. to try to do this. I mean, one of the powers of this method is basically that, is you can get assessment of things like vacancies and correlated vacancies, which is very hard to get in kind of other kinds of approaches. And so if you're thinking about doing a simulation there, then, right, and if it's a molecular dynamics, then you actually need a really big box and you know, and, and so that becomes challenging. Um, so not to my knowledge, in principle, that could be done. And in principle, that would be useful. Um, and well, not in principle, it would be useful. Um, but I think there are some challenges associated with that. Right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah what, what would be the size see, where, you, where it gets interesting? Say 10 nanometers or, or is it 100 uh, nanometers? Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, we've been, this is one thing we've been we're thinking about, and um, there's not a lot of agreement in terms of uh, vacancy level. Uh, like, you know, I've heard values is high. If, if you look in the literature, well, if you look in the literature, you could kind of find any answer you want in this community. Um, <laughs> but, you know, a few percent is kind of reasonable. So whatever the cube root of one over a few percent is times the 10 or six angstroms is kind of a reasonable value. Um, yeah. So I can't do the math in my head. I can't do yeah. cube roots in my head. Yeah, yeah basically um, it sounds like that's like, if you have a structure maybe with 10,000 atoms, you know, it's already possible to account for the vacancies and so on. Maybe with 100,000 atoms, probably for sure or something. Well, that would, that would, I think, go a long ways. I mean, if you have one vacancy in 100 or even 10 vacancies in 100,000, that's, that's, a, that's a reasonable level. So 10 of them is 0.1%. For many materials, that's very high, but not necessarily all materials. And in some cases, that actually can be quite low. Um, yeah. So 100,000 certainly is, is going to answer a lot of questions if, if you can actually mm -hmm. do that. And one of the things that this can be used for then is, you know, you will have to parameterize force fields or something like that. And this could be used as a way to basically test the parameterization of force fields. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's another interesting aspect. <laughs> How accurate are the force fields and so on? And uh, yeah, this can be used for that. Yeah. And, and I was wondering, the, the simulation is giving you the trajectories, but these images are done by Fourier transform or the spatial distribution and then superimposing over time, something like that? Uh, well, the, you know, this is averaged over, a, the, the data I showed you here is averaged over, you know, a, set, a, a five millimeter single crystal. So mm -hmm. that spatial averaging kind of collects, uh, basically does a time, in some ways a time averaging of that kind of measurement. These are neutron experiments, and I didn't really want to go into this in, in detail in, right now because I've overwhelmed people enough as it is. Um, these are neutron experiments. So these are looking at in principle aspects of this, 
static correlation, if I have that right, um, only. Uh, with the neutrons, you can actually get at least some insight into the difference between static and dynamics because you can energy resolve and energy is equal to time um, by just by Heisenberg's uncertainty. With x-rays, you actually integrate pretty much over all energies. So you're basically then looking at um, kind of the snapshot. Um, so there is some distinction there and there are reasons that one would wanna try to do both kinds of experiments. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, you, you know, depending on the nature of the kinds of experiments done, it spatially averages for sure. Um, and then the, the time averaging actually depends a lot on the kinds of experiments, the specific kind of experiments you're trying to do. Right. I have another question. In the lithium uh, battery cathodes that you were describing, you, you did the, the, the case that, well, from the X-ray diffractions and uh, it's difficult to extract the, the details of the atomic information. And I was thinking, it, some people are doing in situ transmission electron microscopy of the process, uh, which I think it would be complementary. Of course, it's not, it's not going to be the full story, but do you see, can you comment if there is any information that can be gathered from those to have build hypotheses and, and models? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm probably not the best person to comment on this, but there are certainly challenges in in kind of local order from, I mean, John, I think showed some interesting ways of going about this in kind of a completely disordered material. Uh, if you have local order, then the problem is typically in a TM, you're imaging through some thickness. And so everything stacks up. And, mm -hmm. and so you may be hard to disentangle local correlations. Um, but in general, you know, as a general comment, TM is only going to, always going to complement the kind of X-ray measurements. Uh, you know, I showed you the electron diffraction that came from this, and then I suspect those papers have got some electron microscopy in them, but I don't right now know exactly what what those are. Um, I think at least in that case, there's not been a lot of success in looking at kind of the local order. And to I what see. extent would the solvent play a role in these materials, or is it is it I mean, or is it reasonable to try? I mean, you know, to just do the solid state characterization. Well, uh, we have done this, right? That, all the work that's been done is is the solid state, so they they pretty okay. much ignored right now the electrolyte, um, and that's just because the, sol the 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 solid part, the solid state part of it is hard enough. Um, you know, I talked a lot about the kind of ion conductivity, the local order aspects in terms of ion conductivity, not so much in liquids, but in polymer electrolytes as well is kind of, you start to understand now a little bit more in terms of ion transport, how the local order actually impacts that kind of as well. Yeah. And you would say it's important to, to capture the real you know, or make predictions or improve the materials, or you think it's okay to compartmentalize the solid state? Sorry, Harris, I didn't quite catch the question. Um, I meant, um, so you think the electrolyte is an integral part of this uh, process in order to, to improve the materials, or, or do you think, just simple question. That's a different thing. It is very important, but that's a completely different talk. Um, and it's mostly an interface talk that has to do with the interaction between the electrolyte and the surface of the cathode and the anode particles, where you have basic reaction layers that form that can basically uh, either facilitate or not facilitate ion transport. Um, that's yeah, also an instability or degradation mode that kind of comes up as well. Uh, there will be some interaction between that and the bulk of kind of the cathode particle. Um, but most of the time we kind of think about these in distinct fashions, which uh, is probably a construct that's a little artificial. 
because the interface is not just an abrupt plane, it's actually a region that spans, well, 10 and potentially 100 nanometers. Mm -hmm. um, so that whole interface with the electrolyte actually does matter in, in many, in all kind of conventional batteries and all kind of uh, uh, more advanced kinds of batteries as well. Are there any other questions? Well, then uh, that's good for the official part of this <laughs> seminar. <laughs> Thank you very much again, Mike. Well, hold on. There, there are a couple of chats in here. Oh, never mind. Yeah.